Welcome to World War I Centennial News, episode number 85. It's about World War I then, what was happening a hundred years ago at this time, and it's about World War I now, news and updates about the centennial and the commemoration. As many of you know, we've extended the podcast to include a Twitter handle, at the WW1 Podcast. That's at T H E W W the number one podcast. This lets us include images and details from the show, and you can ask us questions, make comments, get a link you missed, and even ask us to drop a note to one of our guests for you. Because after all, it's more than just a podcast, it's a conversation about the war that changed the world. This week, as one and a half million Americans have arrived over there, in our history segment, we're going to focus on a hot home front discussion, the new draft goals and methods, what qualifies for exemptions, and conscientious objectors. It's a great look at the mindset of America in August of 1918. Then, Mike Schuster reflects on the turnaround of the war and the German reactions. Dr. Edward Lengel brings us another story of the 28th Division, the Pennsylvania National Guard Doughboys. Jim Therris joins us about his documentary film, The Hello Girls. Douglas Cubison shares the stories of Wyoming Indian Doughboys and The Buzz, where Catherine Akey highlights some of the World War I posts and stories from social media. World War I Centennial News is brought to you by the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, and the Star Foundation. I'm Teo Mayer, the Chief Technologist for the Commission and your host. Welcome to the show. It's mid-August 1918, and 1.5 million American soldiers, representing some 32 divisions, are now in Europe. And they're making the presence felt. But what's happening back home? Well, back home, their absence is being felt. And in mid-August, the press and media is filled with stories about how America must send over more than twice that many soldiers to help the Allies. And to do that, the Selective Service Rules are being revised. We're going to explore the pages of the official bulletin, the government's war gazette published by George Creel, and the pages of the New York Times. In the headlines and the stories, we're going to uncover the thinking and the sentiment of America in mid-August 1918. Dateline, August 22, 1918. A headline reads, Debate on the manpower bill under which America's fighting forces in France will be raised to four million men opens today in both the House and the Senate. Now, this bill, whose details are going to be hotly debated over the coming days, is premised on the widely held belief that America and Europe are going to continue to be embroiled in this conflict well into 1919. From the official bulletin. Dateline, August 24, 1918. The headline reads, More than 1.5 million men now in overseas forces. General March praises work of U.S. troops in France. Now, that force of 1.5 million is certainly having an impact on the battlefield, but equally at home. With one and a half million Americans away and four million contemplated, let's put that into perspective of the country. Based on the census data, the population of America is just over 103 million people living in some 20 million households. So think about how this draft under discussion is affecting everybody. Assuming half the population are men, The new law will put 8% of all men in the country into uniform. That's a staggering amount. Of course, not all men are of draft age, and that's also under discussion. The original Selective Service Act of 1917 stipulates that all men between the ages of 21 and 30 need to register for the draft, but the new manpower bill expands that. From the New York Times. Dateline, 8-22-1918. The headline reads, 18 to 45 draft to be adopted by House. Who goes first? The issue. 
And the article reads, Debate on the manpower bill under which American fighting forces in France will be raised to four million men, open today in the Senate and in the House. Rapid progress was made. A vote is practically assured in the House tomorrow, while the Senate is expected to vote Saturday. The only opposition shown in either House is the provision to include men from 18 to 21 years old into the draft. A handful of senators, led by Mr. Kirby, Democrat of Arkansas, opposed calling men below 20. Mr. Kirby offered an amendment to that effect. In the House, several members advocated an amendment that would put 18 and 19-year-olds into classes to be called last. Now, it's interesting to note that in 1918, there's so much concern over young men 18 to 20 being inducted. This leads to an interesting question of who else is exempt from the draft? Now, there's a number of jobs and roles in American society that were considered essential. Here are some examples from the news headlines. From the official bulletin about Spaniards, because Spain was officially neutral in the war. Dateline, 8-22-1918. The headline reads... Spanish subjects, resident in this country, exempted from U.S. military service draft. Those who have applied for citizenship may withdraw their applications if desiring to remain here in civil occupations. The draft call on the entertainment industries is mixed. Again, from the official bulletin. Dateline, 8-22-1918. The headline reads... Motion Picture Industry Recognized as Essential by War Industries Board Tentative Agreement Reached After Hearing Gives Preferment to Filmmakers and Exhibitors Under Certain Stated Conditions And the story reads The War Industries Board Authorizes the Following after a hearing before the Priorities Commissioner and the representatives of the War Industries Board given by a committee representing the entire motion picture industry and all its branches, from the manufacture of the film to the projection of the pictures on the screen, the following conclusions are tentatively reached and announced. To the extent of the industry's activities in supplying an educational medium and in furnishing to the great masses of the people a wholesome and comparatively cheap means of recreation, it should be and is recognized as an essential industry. But contrasting in the New York Times about baseball. Headline, Major Baseball League Players Allowed Until September 1 to Find Essential Jobs. Full season is denied. Secretary of War finds no reason why further time should be needed by men. Period. And the story reads, Secretary of War Baker today decided to allow organized baseball until September 1, in which to adjust itself to the work or fight order as applicable to ballplayers of draft age. After that date, all ballplayers affected by the work or fight regulations must seek some other essential employment or enter the military service. Now, of course, some men objected to being drafted as a matter of conscience. This from the official bulletin. Dateline, August 19, 1918. The headline reads, Conscientious Objectors Doing Their Bit in the War. Made Useful on Farms Furnishing Muscle-Making Foods for Fighters. And the story reads, The United States Department of Agriculture authorizes the following. After struggling for a long time with the knotty problem of conscientious objectors in army cantonments, the War Department now announces that the difficulty has to a large degree been resolved through the aid of the farm help specialists of the United States Department of Agriculture. In the various states, where there are farming communities which include sects opposed to the war, and where additional farm help is needed, these places are made known to the cantonment commanders together with a record of their farm labor needs. The plan has worked out so well that in three camps where definite lists of objectors were compiled, practically all these men have been placed. Now, as some of our listeners may remember, Sergeant Alvin York 
struggled deeply with his conscience before reaching his decision that his faith would allow him to fight. And that battle for which he received his honors will happen in the coming weeks. But other exemptions are sought because some labor forces are considered critical and just cannot be filled by women, elders, or boys in 1918. Again, from the New York Times. Dateline, August 21, 1918. The headline reads, Ask for exemption of New York police. Merchants Association tells Congress of danger of further draft depletion. Sees menace to nation. And the article reads, Because the New York Police Department is in danger of being impaired by the draft in spite of the fact that the New York police reserves have been built up into a strong and efficient organization, the Merchants Association sent an appeal yesterday to the Military Committee of the House and the Senate and to General Crowder, asking that the New York police be exempted in the new draft legislation. Quote, we respectfully urge that you consider the inclusion in this law of a provision for the exemption of the police officers of the city. Our request is not based upon mere local selfish motives, but instead is found upon the urgent need of the whole country. Calamities of fearful consequences to the whole country might easily happen in this city if the highly trained and thoroughly efficient policemen are further depleted in this manner. So in summary, as you've heard, one and a half million American soldiers are on the ground in Europe. The Senate and the House are working on legislation that will bring that total to 4 million, while everyone is trying to decide what that affects, what industries and individuals should be exempt, and of course, what we don't have time for in the segment today. And what we'll leave for another episode is a deeper exploration of the many holes in the labor force left by the men now in uniform that are being very aptly filled by who else? Rosie the Riveter's mother. A hundred years ago this week, in the war that changed the world. From that deep dive into the moods and attitudes back home, now we go to Mike Schuster, former NPR correspondent and the curator for the Great War Project blog. Mike, your post this week examines the German perspective of the war's turnaround in August of 1918. Germans up and down the command chain seem to be pretty certain of the outcome, don't they? Yeah, it certainly seems that way. So our headline reads, Huge American presence on Western Front, Germans shocked at American strength. The Kaiser received in silence a bitter epitaph. And this is special to the Great War Project. It's a decisive moment in the Great War. Pessimism among the German high command deepens a century ago on the Western Front. In early August, French, British, and Dominion troops are preparing themselves for a renewed battle. That battle will be a turning point, writes historian Martin Gilbert. Canadian troops advance six miles, seize 12 villages, 5,000 German prisoners, and 161 guns. Then the Allied soldiers go over the top. I gave no mercy, remembers one Allied officer. When the Germans stop resisting and make it clear they see they are defeated, the British commander orders a halt in the attack. I did not have the heart to shoot them, he said. Australian troops have a similar experience that same August day, taking seven villages, nearly 8,000 German prisoners, and 173 guns. Said the German Kaiser that day, we have reached the limits of our capacity. The war must be ended. But the Kaiser still does not face the full truth of the German collapse. In his view, reports historian Gilbert, the war had to be ended on a positive note for Germany. When Germany was making progress on the battlefield so that it could obtain at least a minimum of its war aims. August 8th, the century ago, is indeed the black day of the German army. The strength of the Allied forces on the Western Front is nearing 6 million. Nearly one third of them are American. On the home front, reports historian Adam Hochschild, the war of attrition was taking its toll and German morale was crumbling. With nervous sweat visible on his face, the Kaiser speaks to sullen munitions workers at the giant Krupp factory, railing against rumor mongers and anti-war agitators and urging a fight to the end. To every single one of us, the Kaiser declares, his task is given. To you, your hammer. To you at your lathe. To me upon my throne. 
The story in Hoax Shield reports, embarrassingly, he was received with scattered laughs and silence. In a matter of days, reports Hoax Shield, British and Belgian troops recaptured the ground that had previously taken Britain months and hundreds of thousands of casualties to win in the Battle of Passchendaele. On August 10th, a century ago, reports historian Gilbert, seven fresh German divisions arrived to take their place in the line. A group of drunken German soldiers shouts at them, what do you war prolongers want? Senior military and political leaders in Germany and Austria recommend immediate peace negotiations. Writes one, our military situation has deteriorated so rapidly that I no longer believe we can hold out over the winter. It is even possible that a catastrophe will come earlier. He adds, the Americans are multiplying in a way we never dreamed of. One of the casualties in this Allied offensive is the son of the well-known writer Rudyard Kipling, whose son John was killed on the Western Front. Kipling writes his son's epitaph. If any question why we died, tell them because our fathers lied. And that's some of the news from the Great War Project this day 100 years ago in the Great War. Mike Schuster is the curator for the Great War Project blog. The link to his post is in the podcast notes. On this week's segment of America Emerges, military stories from World War I, Dr. Edward Lengel gives us the second chapter of a powerful first-person narrative experience as the action of the 28th Division, the Pennsylvania National Guard, continues its fearsome fight. A warning to listeners, this segment contains graphic descriptions of violence that may be inappropriate for younger listeners. 100 years ago in August 1918, the U.S. 28th Division, Pennsylvania National Guard, engaged German forces in a fight to the finish for the tiny French town of Fimet. It all began as the division's 112th Regiment forded the Vel River to establish a shaky foothold in the village. But the cost was high, and on the night of August 9th to 10th, the 111th Regiment entered in relief. The American doughboys never forgot what happened next. Private Duncan Kemmerer of Company B vaulted desperately over wreckage cluttering the half-demolished bridge into Fimet, racing for his life against high-explosive shellfire. Reaching the north bank, he ran down a street and dodged into an abandoned building with part of his platoon. As some doughboys took up positions on the building's first and second floors, Kemmerer took shelter in the basement with a few other soldiers. Relaxing a little, His buddy found a French magazine and sat down to read it with his feet propped up on a stove, but Kemmerer couldn't rest. Hearing detonations outside, Kemmerer climbed the basement stairs and watched with horror as a German barrage walked toward him, one spine-jarring explosion at a time. An enemy spotter had seen the Americans enter the building. Choking down his panic, Kemmerer decided that the doorway was the safest place to shelter. And as soon as the thought entered his head, two shells hit the building in quick succession, killing eight men, including his buddy in the basement, and hurling Kemmerer 20 feet into the street. He climbed to his feet, and his uniform hung on his body in shreds. Blood oozed from his head and down his back. Agonized and terror-stricken, Kemmerer staggered toward the river, but a soldier pulled him into a dugout aid station. He waited there for treatment until one wounded doughboy stood between him and the doctor. Suddenly, another shell landed in the dugout entrance, blowing the standing doughboy to pieces before his eyes. Kemmerer regained consciousness on the dugout's dirt floor and found himself lying in a pool of blood as shells pounded the ceiling overhead. His mind cracked. Screaming desperately, Kemmerer scrabbled to dig a hole in the floor for protection and mercifully lost consciousness again for the final time. Kemmerer awoke hours later as he was being evacuated through Feem, just across the river to the south of Femet. He became a shell shock patient at a hospital in Chaumont. In the ward, if someone so much as dropped a spoon on the floor, Kemmerer would shriek and dive under the covers. But only three weeks later, the doctor deemed him fully recovered and sent him back to the front. Behind the lines, American General Robert Bullard and French General Jean-Marie de Goutte agreed that the Americans were not pushing hard enough in Fimet. The bridgehead there must be expanded. The doughboys would attack. 
the 111th Regiment's 1st Battalion was ordered to advance up the open slopes overlooking Fimet from the north. Lieutenant Bob Hoffman was there, and he remembered, We were going over right into the rain of death which was coming from in front and to the left of us. We couldn't see much, just the ruined house and outbuildings, the haystack and the wagons. But they were out there somewhere, for from this apparent void was coming a veritable hail of death. We were so close to the guns that we no longer heard the sh 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 of their searching fingers, just the wicked crack they made as they went past our ears. There must have been a battalion of machine gunners in front of us. The noise they made was not unlike hundreds of riveting machines, such as can be heard in building a skyscraper in New York or some other large city. We advanced 50 yards. There was absolutely no place to advance to. We had to fall back to our lines. There was nothing else we could do. We left some of our men dead and wounded in the orchards and fields. The Germans prepared to retaliate by attacking down a road leading into Fimet and its exhausted American defenders. Hoffman noticed the enemy preparations and deployed his men in a block of ruined houses linked with tunnels and strong points. The doughboys had just finished pushing their rifles through holes in the battered stone walls when the Germans charged down the street. The image stayed with Hoffman for years. Clumpity clump they were going with their high boots and huge coal bucket helmets. I can see them coming yet, bent over, rifle in one hand, potato mash or grenade in the other. Husky, red-faced young fellows, their eyes almost popping out of their heads as they dash down the street, their necks red and perspiring. As the Germans entered the village, they ventured into pre-sighted kill zones in front of the Doughboy's barricade and toppled under a hail of bullets. As the fighting raged, a young German breathlessly dodged into the doorway of the house where Hoffman sheltered. Standing in the semi-darkness of the ruined house, the American lieutenant hesitated. Should he shoot the German, yell at him to turn around and fight, or just bayonet him in the back? The last seemed simplest and safest. Hoffman lunged, and with a gasp of surprise, the German died spitted on his bayonet. The enemy raiders were killed almost to a man, but the battle for Fimet had hardly begun. Dr. Edward Lengel is an American military historian and our segment host for America Emerges, Military Stories from World War I. We put links in the podcast notes to Ed's posts and his author's website. And those are the stories from 100 years ago. It's time to fast forward into the present with World War I Centennial News Now. <laughs> This part of the podcast focuses on now and how the centennial of World War I is being commemorated. This week in Commission News, we have an exciting advanced announcement for all of our listeners who are or who would like to be involved with honoring our veterans on Veterans Day. Of course, this year is not just Veterans Day. It's the centennial of the armistice that blessed and poignant moment in history when the World War I carnage and bloodbath on the Western Front finally ceased on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, and the road to peace was begun. For many years, the 11th of November was known for this moment and was called Armistice Day. But as the war to end all wars turned out not to be that, the name for the sacred day was changed to Veterans Day, to become a day of remembrance for all who sacrificed for you and for our country. This year, for the centennial of World War I, this is arguably the most significant moment of the commemoration. And with that, the Commission is undertaking a number of Armistice Centennial events throughout the Veterans Day weekend in Washington, D.C. And it shouldn't surprise you that we're calling the Armistice Centennial events by their acronym, ACE. But this certainly isn't a Washington moment. This is a national and a world moment. So we've been hard at work to find ways to bring ACE to you in large cities and small communities across the nation. We want to support the remembrance of the centennial of the armistice everywhere. And we're calling this initiative Your ACE. And here's what we've put together for you. On November 11, at 11 a.m. local time, 
We're asking all communities and people across America, those who are gathering, organizations at posts, chapters, auditoriums, memorials, cemeteries, churches, or even individuals, to join together for Bells of Peace, a national bell tolling to reflect on and remember those who served and those who fell a hundred years ago and since. But what if you don't have bells or, or you're gathered in a place where there are no bells? Well, this is 2018, so for you, we've created the Bells of Peace participation app. This free smartphone app is going to hit the streets in about three weeks, and you'll be able to download it for your Apple or your Android mobile device. So imagine that you're at your traditional Veterans Day event at your local cemetery war memorial. This may be where you gather every year to remember and honor your community's fallen. This year, you can commemorate the armistice by everyone opening their Bells of Peace app. As the built-in countdown timer reaches 11 a.m. local, Bells of Peace will toll from every device. Together. 21 times. In a remembrance of this very special moment, when the dying stopped over there, but a commemoration of peace isn't only somber. Yes, it's a deeply important time for reflection. But it's also a time for teaching, learning, and sharing about what it means. What happened? Why? Who? So for that, we've created something very special that extends over the entire Veterans Day weekend. Your Ace is offering you a World War I Armistice Film Festival. Now, this is pretty cool. Any organization or community that donates $500 or more to the National World War One Memorial in Washington, D.C. will be able to hold your own community World War I Armistice Film Festival. The commission, as the national organization charged with helping commemorate World War I, has made the arrangements for you to be able to hold public showings of four incredible World War I films and documentaries in your community. They include... Pershing, Path to Glory, a new documentary film that traces the story of Black Jack Pershing, the general who led American forces in World War I. The Hello Girls, a new documentary playing to standing room only audiences around the country. It's the inspiring story about the first women to serve in the U.S. Army and their 60-year struggle to get their veterans' benefits and their 100-year struggle for deserved recognition. Then there's Sergeant Stubby, an American hero, this is the fully animated feature film that you may have heard about. It tells the story about a dog and his doughboy in World War I. And it's a true story. This wonderfully made movie is an ideal draw that can bring entire families and their kids into the commemoration of the armistice. Finally, you'll also be able to premiere the new U.S. World War I Commission-sponsored short film, a Soldier's Journey, which tells the story of World War I through the elements of the sculpture being created by sculptor Sabin Howard for the National Memorial. All you need to do is to supply the location with video playback and invite your community to come in and share and learn and even laugh out loud a little. Stubby has some very endearing, some very funny moments. All at your community's World War I Armistice Film Festival that you can run from Friday through Monday on Veterans Day weekend. And we have a lot more tools for you in the pipeline, things that help you announce, promote, and turn this Veterans Day into your Armistice Centennial commemoration. Together, we can honor the 4.7 million who served, the 375,000 who were wounded, and the 116,516 who sacrificed all for us and for our country. Now, personally, I think they're going to be joining you at your Armistice Centennial event. And you heard about it first here on World War I Centennial News, the podcast. We won't be going public with this until the end of next week. That's when the website goes live, when we're going out to the press. But you can already sign up today for Bells of Peace at ww1cc.org slash bells. That'll get you on the information list about all the Your Ace resources. Or you can send us a note by Twitter at the WW1 Podcast. The centennial of the World War I armistice is on November 11th, 2018. Moving on to our spotlight on the media. Back in March, episode number 62, 
we spoke to author and historian Dr. Elizabeth Cobbs about the book she wrote called The Hello Girls. We followed that up with AT&T's historian, Dr. Sheldon Hochheiser, on episode number 69 in late April. As we mentioned during those interviews, the story was being made into a documentary. And as we just announced, the wonderful documentary, The Hello Girls, is now available for your Armistice World War I Centennial Film Festival. So for today, it's my great pleasure to welcome the film's executive producer and director to the podcast. His name is Jim Theris. Jim, welcome to the show. Hey, Teo. Great to be here. Thank you. So, Jim, our audience is growing so fast that many of our listeners may not have heard the previous episodes when we laid out this incredible story of the Hello Girls. Could you give them a brief overview? Sure. I'd like to read from the opening maybe 20 seconds of the film, some narrative that I have there. In 1918, the U.S. Army Signal Corps trained and sent 223 American women to France as telephone operators. They were intrepid, united in a common cause. They wanted to save France. I think that captures what they were sent over to do during the First World War, and they were fearless. You know, when you think of World War I, you often think of the millions of doughboys that served overseas. But to put in perspective, these women, by the end of the war, and we're talking six months of the time that they were over there, they helped connect over 26 million calls, and they were saving lives. So it was a very, very important role they played, and General Pershing recognized that role. Well, and they were even translators, because most of them were bilingual and translated between the French and the Americans, didn't they? Exactly, yes. And General Pershing recognized how important communications were. The battlefield was changing. So he said, well, I need the best. We're at war. I need the best. And the best at this job were women. And so they went and got American women. And they thought they were enlisted in the army. And then the war ended. What happened? They wore army oaths. They wore uniforms. They held rank. They were subject to military justice. They received awards and commendations. For all intents and purposes, they thought they were in the army, as did their male counterparts overseas. Well, when they returned home, they were told they were never soldiers. And that was because the army regulations that were written at the time only recognized that men could serve. So they were told, nope, you weren't really soldiers, you were civilian contractors. Well, they didn't put up with that though, right? Can you believe they fought for 60 years, led by Merle Egan in Montana, and she just would not give it up. And eventually they did succeed in 1977, legislation that was proposed by Senator Barry Goldwater, Senator Daniel Inouye, Congresswoman Lindy Boggs, was signed by President Carter, but unfortunately only 33 of the women were still alive. Now, you and I had a conversation the other day about your showings and the audience. So who's showing up and how are they reacting? Most of the folks are women. I would say the average age is probably 45 to 50 or older, but the reaction is, I think, very powerful. When people realize that they fought for so long and wouldn't give it up and that many didn't live to see it, people get, I think, a little bit angry. Those are some of the emotions, anger, frustration, happiness, and joy. We cover the gamut. Well, the audience that you describe seem to be boomer women who are the generation that have gone through insisting on recognition and respect and rights and a lot of stuff that hasn't been achieved yet. So this really would seem to resonate to an entire generation. It really does. The other day, I received a link to a clip that you released where you have some actual audio from one of the Hello Girls, Olita Jour, that her daughter found on a cassette tape. Let's take a listen to that. I feel that it was finally a recognition for women in the Army service. There shouldn't be discrimination like that. And I think now that it's going to help for for all the women if they join the Army. I'd say we were pioneer people. Well, the book, The Centennial, the AT&T involvement in your documentary has really shed a lot of light on these women's story. And that's now generating interest and action in the halls of Congress. Could you tell us about that? On June 26 of 2018, U.S. Senators John Tester from Montana and Dean Heller from Nevada co-sponsored bipartisan legislation titled the Hello Girls Congressional Gold Medal Act of 2018. Once this gets passed, I'm not saying if, but I'm saying once this gets passed, 
the women posthumously will receive the nation's highest civilian award, which they deserve. It's Senate Bill 3136. Well, your Hello Girls documentary is becoming a demand film at a lot of festivals and showings. Can you tell us about some of the places where people are going to be able to see it? Yes. Well, coming up uh, on August 27th, we'll be at the In This Appropriate Place to Be, the 100th Annual American Legion National Convention in Minneapolis. We're going to screen it there. Both VFW and American Legion have been very, extremely supportive. We're showing it at AUSA, the Association of the United States Army, here in D.C. on October 8th. And then here's a really neat place we're going to be, Teo, on November 11th, 2018. Myself, Elizabeth Cobbs, Carolyn Timby, and a few others, Helen Richard, some of the daughters and granddaughters. We will be in Chaumont, France, at General Pershing's former headquarters, and we're going to screen the film there for the city of Chaumont. Awesome. <laughs> I know. hundred years later to the date. I mean, I can't believe that I'm going to be there. I pinch myself every day when I think about it. You have a really busy schedule coming up. We do, yeah. The GI Film Festival in San Diego is in September. And then some documentary film festivals are coming up in September, October. Doc Utah in Utah, Chagrin in Ohio, Long Beach in California, the Kansas International Film Festival, and then the St. Louis International Film Festival and the Heartland Film Festival in Indiana are just a few of them that have picked up the film so far. And of course, as we just announced, the Hello Girls is part of the World War I Armistice Film Festival that we expect to be going on in communities all over the country on November 11th. Jim, thank you for making your wonderful documentary available for this. Oh man, that's an honor to be a part of that. Thanks for thinking of us and thinking of the film, and we're looking forward to it. Anyway, we can help. I agree. It's a great story. Jim Therris is the executive producer and director of the documentary, The Hello Girls. Learn more about the film by following the links in the podcast notes. This week in Updates from the States, we're headed to the Big West, the cowboy state, Wyoming. The Wyoming Veterans Memorial Museum opened the centennial exhibit, Wyoming in the Great War, on April 6, 2017, and it's still on view. Among the myriad topics studied in preparation for this exhibit was the service of Wyoming Indians in the Great War, particularly from the Arapaho and Shoshone nations on the Wind River Reservation. Joining us today to tell us more about the exhibit and the service of Wyoming's Indian doughboys is Douglas R. Cubison, curator of the National Museum of Military Vehicles in Du Bois, Wyoming. Welcome to the podcast. Real pleasure to be here. Douglas, Wyoming was made a state around 1890, just about 25 years before the outbreak of World War I. Can you give our listeners a picture of life in Wyoming in that era? Well, Wyoming was an extremely rural state on the cusp of the Great War. And really, we could still be considered the frontier. In fact, in the 1910 census, our state's population was a mere 145,000 people. Only seven towns could be considered to be urban. And we only had one city with a population over 25,000. In 1915, Wyoming's predominant industry was still agriculture, particularly cattle and sheep. Wyoming led the nation in wool production. We actually had 6 million sheep in Wyoming in 1908. Uh, wool was a really big deal at that point. Well, absolutely. And in fact, the war effort could not have been sustained without the wool being provided by the state of Wyoming. Wyoming was on the verge of becoming significant for petroleum production. The increased reliance and the increased use of automobiles, trucks, airplanes results in a huge demand for petroleum products. And right at the end of the war, Wyoming benefits from a huge economic boom. So how many people served from Wyoming? I mean, you have such a small population. A mere 145,000 people in the 1910 census. But significantly, in World War I, Wyoming provided 11,393 soldiers. That is a staggering 7% of its population enlisted. And more soldiers per capita served from Wyoming than any other state in the Union. Now, Wyoming had, and still has, a large number of Indian reservations and people. Could you tell us about that? Well, the most significant Indian reservation is called the Wind River Indian Reservation was established for the Eastern Shoshone Nation in 1863. The Arapahoes joined that reservation in 1878. It's still a very sizable reservation here in the center of Wyoming. 
Now, I know that at the time, Indians hadn't actually been given citizen status, but they still volunteered and served in large numbers in World War I. How did that affect the Wyoming nations? What ended up happening was really the intervention of two extremely significant military leaders. The first man was a fellow called General Hugh Scott. And Scott had served and commanded Troop L of the 7th United States Cavalry, which was a Sioux Indian troop in the 1880s and 1890s. And by the beginning of World War I, he happens to be the chief of staff of the United States Army. The other, oh, a fellow called John J. Pershing. Oh, him. (laughs) He commanded a company of Sioux Indian scouts from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in 1891. Uh, It was called Troop B of the Oglala Indian Scouts at Pine Ridge Reservation. I'm going to read you a direct quote of Pershing from his autobiography. Field work was secondary nature to them. They would send out advance guards and flankers and cover the main body perfectly, cautiously approaching the crest of a ridge as if actually in hostile county. So arguably the two most significant men in the United States Army at the beginning of World War I, Hugh Scott and John J. Pershing, Both had direct experience commanding Indians, believed that they could make a significant contribution to the United States Army, and were very powerful proponents to include them in service. And it did not always go smoothly, but in the end, about 12,500 Indians served in the United States services. As you were doing the project and preparing your exhibit, is there a particular story that struck you that comes to mind? We have been working this for a couple of years now. And it's been kind of a slow and difficult and painful process. But we have now documented six Indians from Wyoming. And one of them is an extremely significant individual who actually, in fact, had vanished and been lost from history. And that is a gentleman called Thomas Daniel Saunders. So we don't know what his Indian name was, but we do know that he was enlisted as Thomas Daniel Saunders. He was a Northern Cheyenne from the booming metropolis of Medicine Bow. We believe he had some Arapaho relationships with some of the Indian families at Wind River. He enlisted in the summer of 1917, pretty much as soon as Indians were permitted to enlist in the United States Army. He became a combat engineer and was assigned to the 2nd Engineering Company, which was the combat engineers that supported the famous 2nd Division. Saunders would have a remarkable and amazing career. He would be wounded at Chateau Terry in July 1918. He was the recipient of the Distinguished Service Cross for Heroism in Action at a place called Jolny, France, on September 12, 1918. And then, not much longer afterward, he received the Croix de Guerre with Gold Star, awarded by the French for leading a patrol under heavy fire near Blancmont, France, on October 8, 1918. And I'm going to read you a quote from his commanding officer, and this is a remarkable quote. Quote, this soldier has shown himself under trying situations to be far above his comrades in all operations requiring alertness, coolness, and dependability backed by fearlessness. But his real moment of glory came a couple years later, November 11, 1921. The unknown soldiers returned from France to be interred at the Arlington National Cemetery. And John J. Pershing handpicks the six men, and they're called the body bearers. And those are the six enlisted men who will personally carry the unknown soldier's coffin. By then, Staff Sergeant Thomas Daniel Saunders is one of those six men picked by Pershing to represent the United States Army Corps of Engineers. Thomas Daniel Saunders was Wyoming's most decorated enlisted soldier of the Great War, a really remarkable man. The Indian service was extremely significant. The 1919 Citizenship Act gave all honorably discharged Indian doughboys American citizenship. In 1924, the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924 is passed. And with that act, all American Indians are given both United States citizenship without relinquishing their citizenship rights of their own Indian nations. So this is a huge event in American history, and it's entirely due to the service of Indian doughboys. And one very special Indian doughboy from Wyoming. Thank you, Doug. Yes, it's a wonderful story, an honor and privilege to be able to relate it. Douglas R. Cubison is the curator for the National Museum of Military Vehicles in Du Bois, Wyoming. Learn more about this great exhibit by following the links in the podcast notes. 
This week's World War I War Tech focuses on one of the most iconic tech tools of the war, also known as Devil's Rope. It's barbed wire. And even before it hit the battlefields of Europe, it profoundly changed America. As America expanded west, the control of grazing and farmlands became an increasing issue. The land was unlike anything these settlers had encountered before. Vast, treeless expanses of open prairie, an ocean of grass and wildflowers as far as the eye could see. With no trees for fences and no stones to build walls, many farmers found the free-ranging herds of cattle would cut across their open land, damaging their farms and gardens. To compound the issue, cattle aren't exactly bothered by regular fencing, so there was a huge need for something that would keep the herds of cattle in check and keep the farmers' lands from their hooves and insatiable bellies. The idea of barbed wire has been around for a long time. In 1868, a man named Michael Kelly had invented the basic design for barbed wire when he twisted two plain wires together to create a cable of barbs. Then in 1874, a guy named Joseph Glidden, a farmer from Illinois, made improvements to Kelly's invention, locking a simple wire barb into a double strand of wire, and he got a patent for it. Glidden's design was cheap, easy to mass manufacture, and effective at confining livestock. Within two years, Glidden was producing 3 million pounds of wire a year. Now, this caused some serious rows between the open-range cattlemen and the land-managing farmers. More than a few shots were fired until the government stepped in and helped quell the situation in the late 1880s. So, barbed wire is pretty darn good for controlling and containing, and when it was used in World War I, it was used in combination with trenches to make attacking across no man's land a literal and figurative pain. More than a million miles of barbed wire were laid down on the Western Front alone, often in tangled masses. Barbed wire was typically laid out in long zigzag strips or in belts running along parallel to the trenches. The more heavy-duty barbed wire could be six feet tall or more. Sometimes, wire would be laid out over entire fields, like those in Germany's densely fortified Hindenburg Line, that could reach as far as 300 feet out into no man's land. Now, one of the great breakthrough technologies of the war, tanks, were specifically designed to roll through the stuff. Barbed wire, a fearsome, brutal, and effective deterrent, both in the rangelands of America and on the war fronts of Europe. We have links for you in the podcast notes. This week in Articles and Posts, where we highlight the stories that you'll find in our weekly newsletter, The Dispatch. Headline, Lost Purple Heart Returned to Family of World War I Veteran 100 Years Later. The U.S. World War I Centennial Commission's veteran liaison, David Hammond, was on hand last week as Purple Hearts Reunited presented the Purple Heart Medal earned by Private First Class Joseph Hish, who was wounded by mustard gas during World War I. His son and grandson received the honor during a ceremony in Washington, D.C. Headline, Massachusetts Mount Greylock added to National World War I Memorial Registry. The Boston Globe newspaper put the spotlight on one of the awardees in the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials program. The Massachusetts Veterans War Memorial Tower received one of the 100 grants to assist in refurbishing the memorial during the World War I Centennial Commemoration in the United States. Headline, Write Blog, The Debt of World War II French Resistance Writers to World War I Veterans. This week, Wright takes a look at World War II writer resistors like Victor Bosch, Albert Camus, Jean Moulin, and Louis Aragon, and the ways their written work and their battle against the Nazis were inspired by the sacrifices of World War I soldiers. And finally, our selection from our official World War I Centennial merchandise shop. Our featured item this week is our U.S. Army Doughboy window decal, a wonderful and inexpensive way to tell the world the centennial is here. It features the iconic Doughboy silhouette flanked by barbed wire. Links to our merchandise shop and all the articles we've highlighted here are in our weekly dispatch newsletter. Subscribe at www.cc.org slash subscribe. 
You can also send a link request with a tweet at the WW1 podcast or follow the link in the podcast notes. And that brings us to the buzz. The centennial of World War I this week in social media with Catherine Akey. Catherine, what are this week's posts? Hey, Teo. There were three particularly popular posts shared this week on our social media accounts. The first is a celebratory photo from the 1st Battalion, 103rd D Field Artillery. They shared a photograph on their Facebook page of the current battalion proudly displaying a battalion flag as well as the commission's flag commemorating 100 years of service. You can find their page in the podcast notes. They've shared many photos and articles about their 100 years of service as well as their service in World War I. A second popular post this week comes from the National World War I Museum and Memorial in Kansas City, where they've recently installed a large handcrafted poppy artwork at the entrance of the museum. Each of the 117 poppies in the reflection pool represent 1,000 service men and women who lost their lives in World War I. The installation will be up through Armistice Day, November 11th, and afterwards the poppies will be available for sale through the museum's gift shop. Finally for the week, there's an incredible production coming to Washington, D.C.'s Kennedy Center this autumn. Silent Night is an opera inspired by the true story of wartime ceasefire, The Christmas Truce of 1914. The production features lyrics in multiple languages, Pulitzer Prize-winning music, and a dynamic cast. The show will run from November 10th to November 25th this year, and you can purchase tickets now at the link in the podcast notes. And that's it this week for The Buzz. And that wraps up episode number 85 of the World War I Centennial News Podcast. Thank you for listening. We also want to thank our guests, Mike Schuster, curator for the Great War Project blog, Dr. Edward Lengel, military historian and author, Jim Therese, executive producer and director of The Hello Girls, Douglas Cubison, curator of the National Museum of Military Vehicles in Du Bois, Wyoming. Catherine Akey, World War I photography specialist and line producer for the podcast. Many thanks to Mac Nelson, our wonderful sound editor. And I'm Teo Mayer, your host. The U.S. World War I Centennial Commission was created by Congress to honor, commemorate, and educate about World War I. Our programs are to inspire a national conversation and awareness about World War I, including this podcast. We're bringing the lessons of 100 years ago to today's educators and their classrooms. We're helping to restore World War I memorials in communities of all sizes across the country. And of course, we're building America's National World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C. We want to thank the Commission's founding sponsor, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, as well as the Star Foundation for their great support. The podcast and a full transcript of the show can be found on our website at www.cc.org slash cn. You'll find World War I Centennial News in all the places you get your podcasts and even using your smart speaker by saying play WW1 Centennial News Podcast. The podcast Twitter handle is at the WW1 Podcast. The Commission's Twitter and Instagram handles are both at WW1CC, and we're on Facebook at WW1Centennial. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget to share the stories that you're hearing here today about the war that changed the world. They're drafting many men right now To give democracy a hand When all goes So long.